Welcome into the Paul Farrington Show. Paul joined alongside Jack Weinberger and Robert Ziggy Ziegler. And joining us today, producer Zach gets a special treat for the show when producer Zach's in the building. Zach, you make the show probably 10 times better. And because you're here, I'm, I'm, I cracked open a high noon in your honor. Yeah, well, and here's the water. It's, Cheers to Zach. Cheers. Cheers to producer Zach. It's Mid-July. I, you know, I got July 3rd. I got the most drunk I've ever been in a long time at uh, Allendale Bar and Grill, but it was a fantastic time. The Wisconsin people would have put you under the table, right? Absolutely not. Absolutely <laughs> not. This, this is the best time of the year for me. High noons are flowing. Zach's back. Sun is out. Guns are out. The pool's open. Summer is awesome. Summer's great. It really is the best. It really, really is the best time of year. So cheers to you all. See, I'm not sure about that, though. Best time of year? Best time of year it's, for me? It's the worst time of year. By right. far. Well, not worse, not worse. But I would say the best time of year is NCAA Thanksgiving tournament. and Christmas. The NCAA tournament's best time Thanksgiving of year, and Christmas. That's that's my favorite. Can I tell can I tell about the the date I had when I said that my favorite time of year was November to December and the response I got? I feel like the statute of limitations is up on that, right? No one's listening to this show. Yeah, you can go for it. I don't okay. think everybody cares. Yeah, it was great. It was when I was taking out a girl a couple of years ago and we're driving um to whatever restaurant. It was like probably first or second date, whatever it was. And I said how much I loved Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I was already on the fence. It was kind of like, all right, is this going to continue or not? Not sure. And because I didn't want to lead this girl on too much if I wasn't fully in. And I'm like, I love this time of year. And she goes, oh, not me. I was, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> what? what is, well, why? What's, what's wrong? She goes, well, it just seems that I get my heart broken every time this year. And I went, oh, God. All right. I, can't, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> was that the... Uh stripper you met or the different yeah guy? right yeah yeah okay okay that, that's why that's why you can't even bring up these stories on this show all of a sudden things are thrown out there it's a different girl i'm guessing a different girl not yeah, the stripper yeah, not, not 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 the stripper okay. Porn star? not the stripper the what no, all right we need to we need to chill out here so today stripper. yeah 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 well, let's relax let's relax the um the topic today you can see i'm in the minnesota viking sweatshirt here it's the nfc north division preview show we've already broken down four other divisions it's you know, you know it's crazy that we're at the halfway point right here we're crossing over into the second half of teams to break down heading into the 2024 season these shows that we always say a lot of work to do them but it's pretty pretty cool for us to be able to dive into these teams and really kind of bring together everything that happens over the course of free agency in the draft and now we're going to give you a quick look and a big question surrounding each team heading into the season and this is the you know this is our bread and butter here these these are our money makers so to say on this show between the lions the packers the bears and our minnesota vikings or ziggy and i's oh minnesota my. vikings what what's wrong oh my yeah oh my oh my you exactly know, well, you, know, you say bread and butter right yeah but you know what's actually i think is a lot better the other day i tried for the first time at dinner they had those bread rolls you know you butter them up yeah bread and butter yeah yeah i brought <laughs> I brought my little thing of cream cheese. That, that's that's messed up. And it was 10 times better than butter. That you, you brought in cream cheese I to a restaurant. I wanted to put the cream cheese to, to a restaurant. Yes. Well, the little things in my pocket, I put it in my pocket. It was a little, like, little thing. It's not the whole can. That's strange. And then... Strange, actually. I wanted to see how it tasted, and it was actually better than, better than butter. So now my, my, term, my saying is, is bread cream. and cream cheese. <laughs> bread and cream cheese. Do you like cream cheese, Ziggy? That, that is weird. That is weird. I'm not, not going to lie, man. Okay, so... Ziggy can't hear me. No, Ziggy's ignoring Ziggy's ignoring a, a comment. I want to talk about football. Easy. I thought you could say jam or something. I think your headphones are screwed up. You, get, you can't seem to hear me. So the NFC North, again, the way that these shows work, we're going to break down each team, the favorite, the top challenger, the dark horse, and the bottom feeder. We'll see. We'll see how the order goes as we go along in this show. Our hearts might be pulled in one direction while our brains go the other way. But we'll start off with the favorite in the NFC North. We're going to go with the Detroit Lions. The Lions... It's uh, It's been a crazy turnaround over the past year and a half for Detroit, starting off the 2022 season one in six. Everyone's making fun of them. You know, Jared Goff's the quarterback. He kind of flamed out in L.A. People are uh, not really in on Dan Campbell. And then all of a sudden, 2022, week nine, they uh, they flip the switch and they go eight and two to close the season. They end with that dramatic win in Lambeau Field against the Packers to keep Aaron Rodgers out of Green Bay. Final game, Rodgers plays with the Packers uh, against the Lions in a loss. Then that last year, of course, 12-5. and five. So they've gone 22-8 and eight since week 9 of the 2022 season. They, they beat the Rams in the playoffs. They beat the Buccaneers in the playoffs. The first time they've ever won the NFC North. First division win in 30 years. Just a, a great, great season for Detroit leading up to the NFC Championship game where 
you know, they're winning 24 seven. You were at, the, you were at the lion's bar with there everybody. was Jack was cheering was. on Detroit, like crazy. I mean, the videos that Jack sent just a madhouse with these lions fans. I mean, losing their minds 30 years in the making. I almost got punched in the face because it was, we were, we were at half and I was just having a great time. I was like seven beers in. Oh, like, how could I'm, you know? I'm like, guys, like, Oh, you know, we, you we're going you to the we're going to the, to the Super Bowl. <laughs> You're not even a fan, and and, you, oh. yeah, and I said, "Well, I'm like, we're going to the Super Bowl." And then my friend Alex, a bunch of the fans were like, "Shh, shh, please no, please no." So, <laughs> then, then when it, so when you it, did this? I did, I did this. Then when it went final, I got death stares, oh. <laughs> and I had to I had to sprint out of that bar. But they were winning 24 7 and a half. And I'm like, this is what we're going. I'm like, Alice, we're going to the Super Bowl. Yeah. Then immediately outscored 17 0 in the third quarter. Dan Campbell, Ziggy, and I have had some, some pretty obvious disagreements about him on this show. I thought he made some very questionable calls, uh, especially on fourth down in that game. And San Francisco winds up escaping with a 34 31 win to go to the Super Bowl. I'm sorry, Ziggy. When, when you're up, you had a chance to go up three scores in, in the, the NFC Championship game. You, you kicked the damn ball. But Again, we've disagreed on this for quite a while. You can go here. back so, and watch our episode. Yeah, you can go back and watch the episode. Um, a great season for Detroit, but obviously there's still some to be desired because they, they are two wins away from where they ultimately want to end up. Uh, and then this offseason, they come in and what was the biggest issue? So the biggest issue for Detroit was the secondary last season, right? There are some, there are some things that need to be cleaned up here. They go and they address the secondary by trading for trading for Carlton Davis. They sign Amik Robertson from the Raiders. They make two, you know, two really solid draft choices and Terry and Arnold, the big steal in many people's eyes. And then they draft Ennis Rakestraw Jr. out of Missouri in the second round. Someone who a lot of people say, I believe he was injured um, Missouri. At, at Missouri, but a lot of people thought that he was someone who could have snuck into the first round had he been a full go. I, I, I believe it was Rakestraw who was injured. I just know that there's a lot of upside to rake straw um so yeah i mean a great a great season for detroit they address their biggest need but do you guys think that they've done enough this off season to find to close the gap or p- potentially overtake the 49ers i mean i when i look at it like the when you when you say have they done enough i believe the answer is yes you know the short answer is yes but even if they sat back and did absolutely nothing i think this team is is ready to compete in the super bowl and potentially win it I mean, like, they, I think they're a top, top three team in, in the NFC, a team who was up 17 in the championship game. Uh, losing C.J. Gunnar Johnson is a tough loss. I think he's one of the better safeties in football, and that obviously stinks. But you get Carlton Davis over, the number one corner. Yes, that was, that was, the, that was the, arguably, but a good corner. Uh, arguably their biggest need. But I think they're like 98% complete anyway. Whereas if they just sat back and did nothing, even like that, what Dallas did, they're ready to, win, to go to the Super Bowl. Like, what, not the, what's changing between last year and this year? How they do not even done anything? Well, I, I really, I, well, I think the secondary was a huge, huge issue for them last year. I mean, you saw what, remember Jordan Love going in there abusing that second. I, it was, it was yeah, but becoming I, a problem. CD Lamb had like 200 yards against it. It's hard to be 100% complete on literally every single Oh, time no, it is. it is. You can, you can, they obviously overcame that. They played the NFC chip and were up by seven. Oh, yeah, it's great. But that's why I applaud them is because they're one of the more complete teams in football. And they went out. How many times, you know, I'm a Viking fan. Uh, there are tons of teams. They are tons of fans want their team to do something to address the obvious and they just don't do it. Uh, but Detroit went after everything that every, everything that they needed to fix. They, they went about that business. So I applauded them. Um, Ziggy, real quick before you jump in, I, I'll, I'm just going to finish off the key additions and departures just so people are aware. And then I'll hit you with the question. Uh, they also bring in DJ Reader on the defensive line. That was another issue was the D-line for Detroit. They bring in Marcus Davenport as well. And Kevin Zeitler, who replaces their uh, their lineman Jonah Jackson. So they had a couple guys leave, like CJ Gardner-Johnson, you said. But honestly, in most areas, they upgraded those spots anyway. Uh, and then another big thing to say is the guys they retained or extended. Ben Johnson stayed. Every, a lot of people thought he was gone. Then Jared Goff, Penny Sewell, and Amon Ross St. Brown, massive contracts. That's actually the biggest spot other than maybe the cornerback positions. They they retained a ton of guys. Like they paid their guys. They they did well by them. So um, so Ziggy, I'm sorry. The question was, have the Lions done enough this offseason to overtake the 49ers? I really like what the Lions did this offseason. As you say, they made some obvious moves like addressing the cornerback situation. Even if only one or two of the three guys they brought in are any good, mm-hmm. they'll still be substantially better. 
But they looked for other opportunities to improve, too. As you said, they brought in Zeitler. Well, everyone else across the NFL was signing guards to $100 million contracts. They got maybe the best guy on the market for yeah. a bargain deal. And this is a team that already, they only had two really bad games last year, that absolute blowout in Baltimore and losing to the Bears, which nobody ever wants to do. <laughs> so as we talked about in our NFC West preview, I feel like some of the other contenders, like the 49ers, maybe the Cowboys, maybe the Eagles are trending down a little bit. Meanwhile, the Lions continue to trend up. So I think, as Jack said, if they stayed a level afloat, that would have been good. But the fact that they're aware of what the problems are, you've got Dan Campbell coming in and saying to this team, that might have been our best chance. So we can't get complacent. We have to work better. The only thing I worry about is they need to get somebody to replace Josh Reynolds. But that will happen. I'm really high on this Lions team this year. I love what they did this offseason. Yeah, I, I thought that had a phenomenal offseason, too to go on top of a spectacular season. The offense really isn't much of a concern for me. I mean, Goff, you know, Goff had this huge year. Amon Ra set personal records himself. The rookie class from Detroit last season, I mean, you know, they get made fun of a little bit <laughs> with some of their... So Jameer Gibbs, that pick, was mocked. I mean, he was sensational last year with David Montgomery. Yeah. They combined for 1,960 yards and 23 rushing touchdowns. That, that backfield is the best in football. And then Laporta broke a bunch of rookie tight end records. I mean, there are weapons all over the place. You, you would like, personally, the one spot that I thought that came up short was in getting a third receiver for this season. Like, I would have liked, so I, I like Jamison Williams. He's okay. I'm still willing to give him another season to prove it. But other than that, there, there's a little bit of room. Like, there's more room on this uh, depth chart. Uh, Khalif Raymond, I think you like him, Ziggy, you said a few times. But is that, am I right on that? He's good, but... Again, they, I think they really only have two receivers who are any good. You'd like to have a third of all the stuff Ben Johnson wants to do. Yeah, Laporte is really the second guy, the second option on this team when it comes to receiving. And you know, Jameer Gibbs isn't bad out of the backfield either. Uh, but yeah, the offense, I'm not worried about at all. Probably the best offensive line in football. It, again, it'll just come down to really, does that defense take the next step forward? Because 247 passing yards allowed per game last year, 27th in the league. They... Camp Sutton didn't work out. Mosley got hurt again. They basically revamped that entire secondary. So it's a matter of whether or not that works. But overall in Detroit, I mean, this is like, I mean, now's the time. We've said it a few times on, on some episodes before. The Eagles, we don't really know how they're going to be. Cowboys, you said, Z, are regressing a little bit. 49ers are getting older. Like Detroit's time is right now. And, uh, and all indications are that they should be back and better than ever. Yeah, if you're a Lions fan, I mean, the aspirations are the Super Bowl. It has to be. 100%. All right, so there you go for the Detroit Lions. Any, anything, any closing thoughts on Detroit here going into next season? I think they're going to disappoint. Really? Yeah. You know, there's a world I could see that, honestly. Well, what does disappoint mean? Like, where they... This is, so, hold on, they, this is dangerous. Like first, this is dangerous like, right uh, now. Like a first-round exit. Giving producer Zach after... Not even oh. first round, I, like, where they go even. Well, you can't go even now, but... You know, you go, they go nine and eight or something like that. Oh, so that, I mean, that would be yeah. nine and eight, and they missed the playoffs because their win total is what, nine and a half going into the season? I thought it was higher than that. Ten and a half? It's just nine and a half, really. I, I Anything under 10 wins would absolutely be a disappointment. And you probably want to get back to that 11 or 12 spot. I mean, they want to win the division. I think if, if they don't win the division, in many ways, it's a disappointment because I don't see this team. They're really good. I mean, they can go on the road and beat anyone, but it's just such a harder path. You saw what Detroit looked like. I mean, if, if, Jerry, if Jerry Goff comes out and flat out stinks, I mean, you never know. But it, but we have no reason. We, to you do know. I, I know there's no reason to believe that, but we've just seen a couple of bad golf. Oh, no, no. Bad. We've seen it before. It's just like, if for anyone who comes out now and says, and I know you're not saying that, I'm just playing devil's advocate for whoever might. Anyone who goes, oh, they have Jared Goff. He, for a year and a half, really, honestly, two straight years, he's been pretty oh, elite no, in he's, Detroit. He's been great. Like, He's been great. Way better than they ever possibly could have imagined. It's uh, what he's he had second most yards in the league and fourth in touchdowns last year. Like, who would have thought that two years ago after that trade? I remember I, I laughed it off when they traded when they traded uh, Stafford over. It's like, oh, all right. <laughs> so they have Goff. Right, they'll, they'll be looking for someone in the draft. And now he might be their franchise quarterback. Okay, so the top challengers, the Green Bay Packers. Go Pack Go, baby. Go <laughs> there, there Pack Go. go. Jackie, people are going to get the wrong idea of what this show's about seeing that. Uh, we're all too familiar on this show with the story of the 2023 Green Bay Packers, the resounding 
week one win against the Bears, we had just just a terrible reaction on this show to that of, of kind of a feeling of doom. Jordan Love looked awesome. Green Bay looked awesome as a whole. Two and one start slips up to two and five after their week eight loss to the Vikings. We were feeling great. All of a sudden, it's joy on this show because Jordan Love's been horrible. He's thrown away games, uh, really struggling. And after a week 10 loss to your Steelers. So, I mean, this show is crushing the Green Bay Packers. They're three and six. Uh, I felt great about where the NFC North was. Obviously, Kirk at that point had tore his Achilles, but it felt like the reign of terror from the Packers was coming to an end. And people, a lot of people were saying, if Jordan Love doesn't figure this out, then the Packers might even be getting ready to look for another quarterback this offseason. It was that. Brian Gutekunst was saying Brian that. It wasn't just that. media yeah. folks. And then a dark day for all NFC North fans. November 19th. Well, besides Packers fans. Besides Packers fans. November 19th, 2023. Burned into memory now for me. A day that will live in infamy. The pack, oh, it could be more than infamy. The Packers beat the Chargers 23-20. From then on, Green Bay goes 6-2, and two, close the season. The regular season, that is. Jordan Love, just an absolute animal. I mean, we'll talk about the numbers in a little bit, but the final 10 games he had were... We, we said on this show, he would have been the MVP of the National Football League if it was a uh, second half of the season award. By that, about, for as great as it looked when they were three and six, the final 10 games were about as miserable as we possibly could have imagined as Vikings fans or whoever, Lions, Bears, whoever's listening to this right now. Um, so they wind up going uh, to the, the NFC divisional round after crushing Dallas. I mean, that, that was kind of nice. I'm not a big Cowboys fan. Um, still don't like to see the Packers win, but if, if they're going to give it to anyone, the Cowboys are a nice team to to destroy. Uh, and then they were really, what, Anders Carlson missed field goal away from going to the NFC Championship game against the Lions. Now, who, who they only would have gone up seven, so who's to say? But I personally felt Green Bay outplayed San Francisco in that game, and San Francisco was fortunate to walk away with the win. Um, and this offseason now, the Packers filled their main, their biggest need with safety. They filled that, more than filled that with Xavier McKinney, and uh, a couple other key additions. Jeff Halfley comes in, the defensive coordinator from Boston College. We'll see. We'll see how a BC guy does. Hey, AJ Dillon and Jeff Halfley. <laughs> uh, Josh Jacobs is brought in for Aaron Jones, flipped to the Minnesota Vikings. So a running back switch there. Some key departures. They lose John Runyon, their guard, Darnell Savage, and Jonathan Owen. Safeties are gone. David Bakhtiari, for, for now, is gone. This, this is going to be filmed a little bit before um, it comes out. So if David Bakhtiari returns to the Packers, I think that would actually be very good for them. Uh, Devondre Campbell's gone. And then Yash Nijman, Nijman their, uh, their guard, I think, believe he was a backup guard, um, also left. <laughs> so uh, they're their big moves in the draft. Jordan Morgan was the... So what everyone knew the Packers needed was, okay, offensive line and safety, basically. That, those are their big, the big spots they want to work on. And in the draft, they, they more than did that with three, I believe, three offensive line picks, four, uh, three additions to... Their secondary, um, four additions in the draft. So they really picked on everything they needed, sort of like the Lions, a good team getting better throughout the season. So that'll take us to our first big question, guys, on Green Bay. It's, will the Packer defense perform at a championship-worthy level under Jeff Halfley? Because the offense seems good to go. Do you trust the defense to take the step forward to being championship-level? Well, not if it's like I mean, what I mean, I <laughs> no, I, I don't think that's true, Jack. And folks, can, they can go back and watch our Jeff Halfley video if they want. But every time Jeff Halfley has gone somewhere, immediately the defense in college was one of the best in the country. We saw it time and time again. They put together a great season when he was at BC. Not all the seasons were great. They completely transformed the secondary when he went to Ohio State. And his calling card has always been aggression. And if you've seen what the Packers have on defense, I think the biggest complaint last year was they have all these pieces, all these first round picks, these edge rushers, and they're just not allowed to go after the quarterback. They're not being given free reign. So I think that with a more aggressive defense, which is something you can do when you have a quarterback that can play, right? You don't have to minimize opponents sco points scored. You just have to try and create things that will give you some momentum, generate turnovers, that sort of thing. I think there's a real chance this defense improves. And what a championship-level defense is, when you've got Jordan Love and the wide receivers they have, doesn't need to be the best defense in the NFL. It needs to be an average defense that can generate big plays once in a while. And I think Halfley can bring that. I mean, defense last year was, like, it had its weeks where it was horrendous. We come on, oh, this, show, like, we come on this show and we and 
we were praising Jordan Love, giving him his flowers, and for good reason. He was fantastic. The offense clicked. Defense couldn't it couldn't stop anything. Twenty third in defensive EPA last season. They like, almost lost to the Panthers. Yeah. They gave up thirty points to, yeah. the like to the Panthers. That's the best Bryce Young looked all year. Yeah. Uh, but then as the season went on, we saw a totally different team, not just offensively, but defensively too. And I'm not saying they were great, but they went from what was pretty piss poor to average. And they did get much better. They did a lot better. They let Jordan love the offense do their thing. And if they do their thing, like Ziggy said, the defense is average, not great, average, just not terrible, which I think it'll be more than average this year. Especially with the addition of uh, McKinney as well, big well, need. Remember too, like as the season as the season went on, after they got rid of Joe Barry, they were struggling so much to get pressure on the quarterback. Kind of like you were saying, Ziggy. Those final few weeks, though, they started to turn that pressure up, and that coincided with them winning towards the end of the season. <laughs> you know, as 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 they got more pressure on quarterbacks, it kind of took a little bit off um, a secondary that was really struggling for a lot of last season. I mean, football too has changed in the last few years. Where I used to be a firm believer in in defense wins games especially big games in the playoffs now i believe if your offense is very good and your defense is above average you can beat anybody and that's what green bay is i mean yeah the game the game's changing and, and one thing that people need to acknowledge with the the packers defense this year you look at along the front seven a lot of you know, first round draft picks are there that they weren't getting first round level production out of you know what whether or not they're recent first round picks i don't care but you have a lot of really good talent on the back end, though. It's it's kind of a new secondary. If you look like Eric Stokes played three games last year. Jair was hurt for a lot of last season. Javon Bullard, Xavier McKinney. Those are both new faces in, in the secondary. So even though, you know, you have Stokes returning, you have Alexander, who's been there before. Those guys were were not anything close to 100 percent. I mean, Stokes, you didn't even see him. So in some ways, it's kind of fun when you're if you're a fan of a team and you have someone returning from injury to be like, oh, it's almost like we're adding him this year. It's like the Vikings are almost adding Justin Jefferson, it feels like, because he was out for most of last season. So, you know, between those four guys coming back, Edrin Cooper apparently has looked great so far, their rookie linebacker. It, there's a lot of pieces for Jeff Hathley to work with and a lot of new faces coming in. So the ceiling is a top 10 defense. And if they get to that with the offense and we expect them to be awesome, uh, yeah, it's unfortunate, but the Packers are going to be really, really good. Um, the last thing before we move on to the Bears here with Green Bay, um, we've mentioned this quite a few times, but since it's the preview show, we have to say it. The first nine games versus the final 10 for Jordan Love. Here are just some comparisons. The win-loss record, first nine games, three and six, ended seven and three. Completion percentage, 58.7 up to 69.8. Pass yards per game, 223 to 261. Touchdown interception ratio, this is the big one. 14 and 10 to 23 and three. And then the passer rating, 80.5, jumps to 112.1. So just an absolute, you know, scorcher to end the year for Jordan Love. And I personally think that of all the feelings us NFC North fans can have about Green Bay, this is sort of the time of fear. Because last year, it was joy at the start, disbelief. And now we're in that, like, denial phase, kind of like, oh, like, this really can't be happening. If Jordan Love comes out on fire... We move on to step two of the seven stages of grief, and we're in pain because it, it it couldn't like they can't continue. It just I mean that's denial right there. Yeah, it can't continue. The other day I was talking to a uh, to my brother as a fellow Steelers fan himself, and I was saying how it's quite sad that we're never going to see another Ben Roethlisberger ever again. Like the truth of the matter is, we probably will not. And I'm like, you know, who does though? Like, we'll, yeah, right. we'll never have another Tom Brady on the Patriots or Eli Manning on the Giants or Drew Brees on the Saints. These guys don't come around that often. And yeah, I mean, here we go. You get Brett Favre, Aaron Rodgers, and Jordan Love now. Yeah, I'm not. I mean, I'm not willing to go there yet. No, like, no, no, no. I know. Not I know. Yet. Not yet. But that's the. Demand. It would just be very, very fitting. Poor Jeff. He got dealt a bad card when it comes to the Steelers. Yeah, just yeah. young enough to catch the end of the run. The end of like Ben's good. Years, but didn't see any real winning. Yeah, tough, tough blow for Jeffrey. Was he not around for a Super Bowl? He was. He was around. Yeah, he was but he was, he was, the Cardinals. Yeah, well, he was yeah. like he was a, a baby. Yeah. Just the look on Ziggy's face throughout that final segment. There, just, <laughs> he's just. He, he, I, he, he didn't even. You didn't oh. even mention the best part of Jordan Love, which is even though the Packers' offensive line was decent last year, when he did get pressured, it very rarely resulted in sacks or turnovers. 
So, I mean, that's another one of the big changes that he improved on as the season went on was the footwork, the avoiding the sacks. It's just, you know, I don't want to see the Packers do well, right? My hope is that that half a season run of MVP level performance drops off. And it is likely that Jordan Love won't be quite as good as the peak you saw during those games because every NFL player has ups and downs in their performance. I hope Jordan Love mate does a uh, big time regression like Ryan Tannehill. It's probably not going to happen. There's a decent chance he's going to continue I, I to be good. I can't believe we're still having and, this Ryan Tannehill Jordan Love conversation. I mean, wait, 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 look, look I mean, Ryan Tannehill. It's a yeah, possibility for that. Dolphins Tannehill? Yeah, or, the, is it or, was, no, it was the Titans, right? Titans, Early Titans Tannehill. Tannehill. Is what but yeah, Ryan Tannehill put together a season and a half of top five production. But you, NFL, when you watch the games, you were never. Wa- it was never. Well, but it's so easy on. to be backward looking doing that, right? That when when you throwing, watch the tape, you'll see what you want to see. Is that when you're throwing? So, he passed the game acting and like Ryan Tannehill. Let's, 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 let's go to the Bears. Let's go. Let's go to the Bears. Let's go to the Bears. The right. Bears. Ziggy wants to go to the Bears. I get what Ziggy saying. I get what Ziggy's saying. The uh, Ziggy's a big. Well, you you got to let me have some hope, right? As a Vikings fan, this is all we've got. All we can do is sort of sit there and just hope that the performance we saw from Jordan Love was a fluke. You've got to let me have some hope, Paul. It'll probably be Otherwise, like, what, what am I doing their, here? Their offensive line is going to be better. Their receivers are in their second year. If they bring back Bakhtiari, again, he might sign, might not by the time this video comes out. If he does come back, I like that. You know, there's a chance that the Packers offense just explodes. So, okay. Well, with that, we'll go on to the dark. We didn't even mention so- Josh Jacobs. Yeah, we didn't even mention Josh Jacobs. <laughs> Don Jones is better, right? Well, that's because he's irrelevant. He's a running back. Uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. No, bet- between... I forgot that Zach's on my side with that. Between the line, Josh Jacobs, the receivers, it, it could be. But hopefully, again, we're, hope- we're hopeful on this show. I do think uh, there might not be a better candidate for, for fitting the term dark horse than the Chicago Bears this season. Can I hear your bear growl? <laughs> I'm actually very excited to hear this one. Because <laughs> like you tried. Oh, did you try that? Oh, wait. I did not try. <laughs> that, that was like that was like a cub. <laughs> what are you saying, Zach? <laughs> no, I said I'm very excited because I feel like Paul, for some reason, deep down, loves Caleb Williams and loves the the Bears because of that. What? The, what is, I don't even know what that means. I don't know. I feel like you've always been on the Bears side lately. No, I, I well, I think Caleb's really good. Yeah, I've right. I've thought he's I'm like one of the only people that I know who who has been okay. Caleb's awesome and has just maintained that throughout the entire draft process. All of a sudden, it was bewildering to me when people were coming on saying, yeah, you know, maybe he's not a generational prospect because he sucked behind an offensive line that couldn't block anyone with no receivers on the team. It's like, I, we watched he USB sucks. play. He sucks. And he's running for his life. If you go and watch Caleb Williams' film from last season, every single play, he's running for his life immediately. And it's like, oh, wait a second. So if when he's making a, a throwing a dime 40 yards downfield on the run every once in a while, but then sometimes he gets sacked because he's you know getting blitzed every play. Maybe that makes sense. Maybe that's an issue with the USC team, not as much. Right, how red is your throat? Talk about the Bears. <laughs> I'm just saying. So the Bears, I do think, are a great candidate as a dark horse um, because really, like, there is a lot of hype around them, but at the same time, people don't realize how high the ceiling could be given both sides of the ball. It's not just the offense for Chicago. The defense is also really good. Um, but in 2022, remember the last place finish, picking first in the draft. They came in last year, started 0-4. They hadn't won a game in a in a year, basically. Remember all the memes that were coming out? Yep. This has happened since the last time the Chicago Bears won a football game. Didn't they lose to the Broncos? They they did, though. They lost to the Broncos. In their own four. It was a great game. It was one of Fields' better games. He fell apart at the end. Um, but again, their first win on October 5th was their first win since October 24th of 2022. So they went almost a full year. Two and seven start. Then they end the year five and three. Justin Fields came back from his injury, uh, played some of the better football of his career with the Bears. Um, but, you know, they they blew their leads against the Lions and the Browns when they were making that sort of playoff run. Came up short, going to the offseason with the question, who's going to be the quarterback of the future? Everyone knew it would be Caleb. So the key additions they made after drafting Caleb Williams, they add Keenan Allen. They add DeAndre Swift to a, a pretty big deal, all things considered. Uh, Gerald Everett joins Kevin Byard. They also draft um, Roma Dunze. So their their weapons completely revamped. Compl- like everyone joining DJ Moore, uh, a ton of talent across the Bears offense. Uh, key departures, of course, Justin Fields, Darnell Mooney leaves, defensive tackle Justin Jones, who I believe was second in the team in sacks last year. Not that you know, not that anyone in the, the Bears defense, other than Sweat, was generating much pressure. But guard Cody Whitehair is gone, and so is safety Eddie Jackson, a fan favorite. 
of our good friend Weston Dell. You remember how much uh, Weston used to cheer on Eddie Jackson? He loved that guy. So, <laughs> what? What? What are you laughing? You, at? you just said it and forget it. Kind of. I don't know. It was oh, so no, funny. You were just like, "Oh, my friend likes it." Goodbye. Yeah, Weston was a big, big, big fan of Eddie Jackson. He's a Bears fan favorite. It's a random fact. Uh, a big, a big extension to J- Jalen Johnson as well this offseason. Four years, seventy-six million dollars. So I'll go to Ziggy first on this one because it's a little, a little closer to home with the NFC North. Um, if Caleb does perform to the level that I personally expect, not Jack, how high is the ceiling for this Bears team in year one? I mean, this Bears team improved at nearly every position other than their defense. That's the offseason. So adding Kevin Byard, yeah, this offseason. And the defense, if you remember, ever since the trade in the middle of the season, they improved significantly, right? Adding Montez Sweat was a huge difference maker on the defense. The defense was borderline top 10 towards the end of the season. And as you say, they've improved basically everywhere on offense. So I think if things go right for this team, if just if Caleb Williams is an, a slightly above average quarterback, we're not saying elite year one or anything like that. But if he puts together a strong season, some up, some downs, but overall above average, this team could easily win 10 or 11 games. Right. You have to keep in mind, even uh, Justin Fields, I think, is significantly worse than Caleb Williams. They still played Tyson Bajan for four games in which they went two and two. Like there were, there were a lot of problems on this team. Everybody forgets there were four games of Tyson Bajan, who I know people are talking about whether he was the next guy when he was playing. Obviously not. Right. But we've seen it. Caleb Williams can produce at a high level, even when the offense around him in college, particularly last year was actively bad. Put him in a decent, above-average NFL offense, even if Keenan Allen misses some time, even if Romo Dunze has some difficulty adjusting. That's so much better than Darnell Mooney and Equinemia St. Brown. I think this team could be very strong next year. Whoa, whoa, don't hit on EQ. Don't hit on EQ. He's your boy. Well, EQ is my EQ is our guy, right? Yeah, he went to Notre guy. Dame. He was decent, but you're telling me EQ versus Romo Dunze? Come on. So, uh, if... if- if expect if he performs up to what what you think his ceiling is, because you know what I think. I see where this you know is what going. I think his ceiling is. It's like a worst mark is married. I would split the difference. Split the difference. Yeah, split like the difference. Seven and ten. Okay, but if they if he is what you think he could be, with the playmakers around him, which he hasn't had, a defense that's pretty slept on too. I know people are talking about a Dunze and Caleb, and obviously for great reason, but. I think this this Bears defense is also very solid as well. Arguably the best in the NFC North. If everything clicks and Caleb can be 75% of of what the world thinks that he's capable of, there's no reason not to think they could win 9 or 10 games and make a, get a wild card spot. Mm-hmm. I agree. The defense does, like you said, there's a star at each level. They have Sweat there. And once Sweat joined... They went from allowing 27 points per game to allowing 18 points per game. Like that, that was the one of the biggest additions to a team of the entire season. And you know, no one's really saw it coming to that degree. But the Bears couldn't get pressure on anyone. Like no one could get pressure on the Bears most of the season. When Sweat came over, that opened everything up for everybody. And at the second level, they have uh, they have uh, Tremaine Edmonds and um, T.J. Edwards, and of course Jalen Johnson. So, I, like the defense. The one thing is, I, I do think when they took a Dunze, they could have got another pass rusher. Like Dallas Turner was there, maybe someone in the secondary to to kind of further boost that unit. That's what I want to see is, will a Dunze make, like, how do those rookies perform? If, if Dallas Turner is amazing with the Vikings and a Dunze is kind of flopping, that could have been something that could have really changed the Bears season. So I, I'm keeping my eye on that personally. Do you want to play a game called a rookie cookie? I've never, I have no idea where this is going. So we should pick three what? rookies. Three rookies from the same division. <laughs> Ziggy, that was disgust in Ziggy's voice. So it's three rookies from the same division. In this case, be the NFC North. And we each pick one who we think will have uh, the best season. They can be anybody. And whoever has the worst season out of the three. Uh, no, I forget. No, 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 I, I don't. I don't. Whatever Jack is about to say, on. I don't think we can air it. I forget. I forget <laughs> the last part. I forget the last <laughs> part. Of, you forget the game. I, I, forget, I forget the last part of the game. Yeah, but it's called rookie cookie. All right, work on that. Work on rookie yeah, yeah. cookie. Work on, work rookie. on rookie. Yeah, so the, the game is you pick three rookies, <laughs> and that's that's what you've got so far. 
Okay. Um, so, so we're high on the bears on this show, but they, but they, uh, they've, they've made, obviously, I think they had the best off season in the NFL. And just so you guys know, you know, DJ Moore or, um, Justin Fields to DJ Moore, that connection rated the highest. There were five receivers who had more yards than DJ Moore last season. And it was all like, you know, elite receivers. It was, uh, Tyree kill. It was Amon Ross St. Brown, AJ Brown, those guys, the connection from Justin Fields to DJ Moore had the highest passer rating. Of any of them. I mean, Justin Fields is an amazing quarterback. Well, well, it's just the DJ Moore impact. Like, he, he is so underrated that now that you add Keenan Allen off of one of the better seasons of his career, all the guys they have, I, I, I really think that this the ceiling is so high for the Bears. It could, it could fall apart because of the Bears, but the season is so high. And that takes us, unfortunately, to the bottom feeder of the division, who really isn't as bad as the bottom feeder of many other divisions, but the Minnesota Vikings are there. Where they, they, uh, where they belong. Yeah, it's too bad, too, because if Kirk Cousins was still in the picture, had he not torn his Achilles, who knows where the 2023 Vikings end up. I keep saying I thought Kirk was playing the best football of his entire tenure in Minnesota before the Achilles injury against the Packers. But, you know, injuries happen. It sucks. It uh, it wasn't like the Vikings defense was good enough to, to be anything more than probably a divisional round team had they won a, a wild card game. But uh, the Vikings make a tough decision this offseason to to let Kirk go. They don't match Atlanta. Kevin O'Connell says, as much as I would have maybe liked to have Kirk here, the right thing to do moving forward for our team is where we are today. And where are we? So the key additions this offseason, Sam Darnold joins Aaron Jones, Jonathan Grenard, Andrew Van Ginkle. They're brought over, hoping to supplement the loss of Daniil Hunter. Uh, Shaq Griffin came over. Blake Cashman from the Texans, a linebacker. What was that? What's, what's going on here, Zach? You you getting bored to listen to the? Well, he likes talk? he likes the gink. No, he no, likes I the love gink. the gink. I, the I gink. was gonna say gink, yeah, gink yeah, but the, I had to stop myself. The, the gink is his boy. The gink is my boy. Yeah. Then some key departures. Obviously, Kirk, Daniel Hunter, DJ Wanham, and the draft. They trade up for JJ McCarthy. They trade up for Dallas Turner. Those trade decisions that are under heavy, heavy scrutiny. And Justin Jefferson gets the massive extension. So. Here we are now where the Vikings have a really talented team, great offense um, that's just sort of missing the quarterback right now, and a defense with a lot of young players that played way better than expected under Brian Flores in year one, but still a long way to go. So again, I'll go to Ziggy because this is our team here. Um, one, you we do expect J.J. McCarthy to take over for Sam Donald at some point this season, right? And then what does he need to do in your eyes to justify being the 10th overall pick? Absolutely nothing <laughs> this year. I don't care what I see from J.J. McCarthy because this is what the pick it was. Like, we're not drafting J.J. McCarthy for the production this year. I don't think they will put him in until they think he's ready. And honestly, I don't care how bad he looks because guys have good rookie seasons, guys have bad rookie seasons. Unless it is truly, truly awful, that's not going to give me much reason to believe he is or isn't going to work out. Because if you look at the history of rookie quarterback picks – Especially when you're looking at a guy who was QB4 in his class. QB5 in his class, actually, right? Traditionally, that doesn't work out. Now, it could be a really good class. He could do better than expected. But I'm not sitting here waiting for the week one results to say, all right, or the first week he plays, say, all right, J.J. McCarthy's the guy. J.J. McCarthy isn't the guy. Unfortunately, you know, that makes me sound like kind of a downer. I am kind of a downer (laughs) on the Vikings this season. I am, there's really not a lot to look forward to, right? I mean, at least last year of the quarterback carousel, things were interesting. You know, from Cousins, Dobbs, Mullins, Jaron Hall, like you never knew who was going to be starting for us. I'm sorry to sound like a downer, but I don't, there's not a lot I'm looking forward to this year. I think it's going to be a lot like last year where our great games are the games where we almost beat good teams. And we'll move on. JJ McCarthy year two. That's when I'll start paying attention. Okay. I mean, just don't be totally abysmal. I mean, do a couple things. I think that's it. I think it's it, just I, not stuck. No, like, do a couple yeah. things. It's like, oh, you know, maybe this guy, maybe this guy's not bad. I, I think like a two year, a, a two season window is is what it is right now. I mean, you see a guy like Josh Allen's rookie year, not great, but does some things. You're like, all right, maybe he's got he's got something, and he becomes one of the better quarterbacks in the NFL. Uh, so I think one season, especially with. McCarthy's situation being the worst team in the division, you got to cut him. But, but it's a great offensive situation. It's like when you look at the division yeah. as a whole, Aaron, Aaron Jones isn't that far behind any of the running backs. The receiving room is arguably the best. And then the offensive line is probably what behind Detroit. 
and then it and, and then it's the Vikings, assuming that some of the guards don't fall off a cliff. Yeah, no, but in the first season, like if he's playing just like almost average football. Oh, that's it. Fine. Yeah, that, yeah, that's all that's all we want. That's really all it is. If, if the Vikings have a good fun. season, it's I mean, if the Vikings have a good season, it's not gonna be because of JJ McCarthy, right? It's gonna be because Sam Darnold looked like his efficient Carolina Panthers self. That did well in a functional offense, and the defense turned things around. That's what we keep and, like, that's a up. possibility. No one's talking about that. No one is talking well, about that. I, I have the Vikings going five and all, remember? With yeah, well, Cam, yeah, yeah. With, <laughs> with, with Sam Darnold. Yeah, you're a but, lunatic. But the thing is, Sam Darnold. See, you know, I just heard it. I just heard it when I said that there. I'm talking myself into Darnold being like a, a viable. But if he is, let's pretend he is. Like, if Sam Darnold's solid, this is a really good, like, this is a good team. And I think there's actually playoff aspirations if Darnold is solid. And we've never had Sam Darnold in this sort of situation. This is when people are going to start saying, listen to the Viking fan go off. But, uh, you know, the defenses should be better with Flores, and I, I expect them to be somewhat competitive. Now, there's all, an alternate world where they start with the Giants, who knows, but then San Francisco, Houston, Green Bay, the Jets, Detroit, and LA, and the Rams. That could be six losses right there. That could be 0 and 7. And then, then, then the season's over, and it's just throwing McCarthy and see what he does. But there's more, of the, I think there's a better chance than people realize that the Vikings can be. Like playoff competitive this year, not division, but play about a wild card competitive. What if the uh, Vikings are like zero and four under Sam Darnold, bring in McCarthy, and he wins the Super Bowl? Well, I'd, I'd be thrilled. What if, what if, that, <laughs> that, that JJ cute. McCarthy, we can sign him to a five hundred million dollar deal, and he can be terrible for the rest of his career. And <laughs> yeah, right. care. If the defense is good in Minnesota, if the secondary steps up, like they they will be a wild card contending team. That's that's what I can assure Vikings fans. The quarterback play will not be as bad as it was last season. And if the defense, which is ranked 31st, 28th, and 25th, it's horrendous. The secondary has been horrendous. If that steps up to just average, this team has a shot of, of being a wild card team. That's, a, that's, that's what I'll say about the Vikings. I really like what they did this offseason. They made some tough decisions, and we stole Andrew Van Ginkle, which was Again. one of my favorite. Actually, one of my favorite ones. Somebody rang the gangster. All right, let's finish up this AFC North episode with the predictions. The non-quarterback player to watch in the division. So there's, a couple, there's a couple very okay, obvious choices. I can't say Caleb Williams. That's no, not QB. Not QB. No non-quarterback player to watch. Anyone have anyone jump out to mind for them? I might go Roma. Do you I'll say. say yeah. okay. uh, was, was, that, was that it, Ziggy? No, I was going to say somebody has to say it, so I'll be the one to say it. Justin Jefferson, best player in football. Yeah, I, I was waiting. <laughs> Justin, I mean, we'll see how he carries either. Well, giving Darnold best weapon of his life, and then also, you know, McCarthy having someone who's unstoppable. It'll be fun. And I'll, sorry to steal it. I mean, I, mean, I just ex- explained that. I'm sorry. Why just, I'll, why just, just, just to put it in context, so you're seeing all these wide receivers negotiate for deals this offseason, right? There is no other position where guys are anymore other than where guys are rushing the front of the line and saying, I want to be the second highest paid guy at the position. Right, that's what everyone who's asking for a mega deal is asking for, because everybody in the NFL knows they're not as good as Justin Jefferson. There is no other position where players are negotiating like that, except yeah. one. <laughs> Who do you, you so you said a Dunte? I said Rome. I mean, I, I think this guy's super talented. Probably the best receiver who came out of the draft. I loved him back in uh back in college. I think he's super gifted, and there's a lot of hype. And he's, it's his first year as a youngster. I want to see how him and Caleb Williams gel and what, the, what that looks like. I'll try and pick someone from the Lions or the Packers here. Actually, you know who I really I, I really can't wait to watch him play next season? It might not be the guy that I'm most like interested in in terms of how he's going to affect the team. I, like Jameer Gibbs, I think, might just be amazing in year two. I think you have this obsession with him since you've drafted him. Well, I dropped him. I watched it, him all the it, time it, last uh, year. In fan- yeah, I, I had him obsession. on my fantasy team. Well, I mean, he was, he was <laughs> in weird obsession. It's a weird, yeah. it's a weird no, obsession. Not. When no, Jameer it, Gibbs gets the ball, he's electrifying. Like, when the way you're talking about Gibbs is like, no, no, he's no, great. No, no. He is, he is, so, he's down. phenomenal. The reason people so were down on the Gibbs pick wasn't because he would be down year one. It's because historically, when you're drafting guys like running backs and linebackers, they produce most of their value in year one. But it's like Gibbs arouses you in a way. No, he doesn't arouse me. I just think he's fun to watch. Like David Montgomery, if David Montgomery wasn't there, Jameer Gibbs would be a top three fantasy player. Like he is, I, I just think every time he gets the ball, he, he's explosive. And, and that's pretty you, cool. Like, after you say Jameer Gibbs, you pause like Jameer Gibbs. Pause. <laughs> I like watching Jameer Gibbs. Sue me. If it had to be someone on the Packers, 
I think that I think the most interesting thing on the Packers is what receiver breaks out. But if you had to pick an individual player, it might be how Xavier McKinney fits in with Jeff Halfley. Uh, preseason division MVP could be interesting here. Hmm. A lot of good candidates. Got to think about that there's, for a little bit. Really, two candidates, maybe one. No, there's two. I'm gonna go G O F F. Goff, goff, goff. He stole. He stole mine. I don't want to take love. It's just so lame. You can take Goff. I, I think. No, I, I don't want to take love. It's Goff or Love. I, yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to go with Goff. Or Caleb. Maybe Caleb. No, he's the worst quarterback in the NFL. I'm going Goff. Or Jefferson. I mean, Justin Jefferson could be the MVP. Uh, I think by definition, he probably is. But I think the Lions will have 12 wins. So I think it'll, better it'll than all of them, Penny Sewell. Penny Sewell. That's but, all right. So but, Zach says Penny Sewell. You say? I'm going to go Goff. Goff. Ziggy? You say Goff? Goff. Uh, you quarterback. Um, Quarterback award. It is. Yeah, I have to say Justin. I mean, I think I'm contractually obligated to say Justin Jefferson. I think he'll be the uh, division MVP. I think by definition, he is. If I think Kirk he's the was most there, valuable player. If Kirk was there, he'd go for 1,800 again. But we'll see what happens with Donald. And the predictions. Last last but not least, the predictions for the NFC North on the season. I'm First, go, second, third, fourth, Jack. I'm going to go Lions. Well, the order, the Lions, Packers. Chuck, right. Chuck, Chuck, Chuck. Bears, Vikings. Some of you are. Well, no, this I guy was, no, no, I thought it was 13 and 4, didn't I? I'll go Lions, Packers, Vikings, Bears. Packers, wait, say that again? Lions, Lions, Packers, Vikings, Bears. Vikings, Bears. Now, okay. Every time you guys say that, I want to say, oh my. It just, it just comes to, it's just so much like that. Could be a problem. Could be a problem. Yeah. All right, Ziggy, how about you? Lions and Packers and Bears. Oh my. Lions, Packers, Bears, Vikings. I'm down on the Vikings this year. Yes. So I also agree that I'm on Lions Packers and then uh, third place. I'll say the Vikings. No, it's probably going to be the Bears and the Vikings, unfortunately. All right. There you have it. The NFC North show for all those who paid attention. Long show. But, you know, this is, again, this is our uh, bread and cream cheese team. Hell yeah, it is. We got to uh, we got to make it count here. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, become a member. Great stuff, Zach. You can become a member. You can listen on audio as well. For anyone who stuck around this long, we thank everyone. And we'll, uh, we'll see you with the next episode of the AFC North on Thursday.